And how do you incorporate uh, the mindfulness work into couples that have sexual issues? Ah, that is a place where mindfulness is exceedingly useful. Um, and one of my mentors in the sex therapy field, Suzanne Ayasenza, has really put together a beautiful way that she gives people, and I do this as well, to give people an exercise, right? Maybe it's just massaging each other's hands. Maybe it is touching each other's bodies. But being able to get in touch again with the thoughts the feelings, and the, what it's like in the body. Welcome to Couples Therapy in Seven Words. I am your co-host, Judy Alexander, and I'm here with my husband, Dr. Bruce Chalmer. Hello, Judy. Hello, listeners. Uh, just a, a little mention again, as we mentioned, I believe, last time, we've switched back over to just audio. That makes it accessible to you folks on Spotify. If you, Those of you on Spotify, if you notice that, hey, how come the last time you were on here was like a year and a half ago, and now you're back? It's because we had all those videos in between, and if you're a coming to us from one of those platforms that doesn't do videos, if you want to see a lot of really cool um, episodes in between, please go to our website, ctin7.com. That's the number seven, ctin7.com. And you'll be able to see all of our episodes, including the video ones. But here we are on audio. Here we are. And Judy, tell folks, what's the title of our episode today? Our title is Mindfulness, Sex, and Vulnerability an interview with Wendy Dumbroff. And we've just completed that interview and it was just delightful. She's really mm -hmm. interesting and very yes, she knowledgeable. Is. She's a couples therapist, sex therapist. Uh, also works with individuals. Yes, uh, works with individuals, indeed. yes. Yeah, and, uh, and the, her, uh, the way she uses mindfulness in the course of her work, uh, including with couples, although she pointed out, it's not like she'll sit there and do meditations very often with couples, right. but it's it sort of <laughs> imbues all of her work and uh, I just thought it was fascinating. And, and I, I mentioned, here's a teaser for you folks. I mentioned at one point after she, she talks about her journey into the work and I'm sitting there and I say, I say in, the, in the podcast, oh my God, I think that we are spiritual siblings. And yes, if you wanna know why I say that, listen to the podcast. Very similar paths. <laughs> listen to the you? interview and <laughs> you'll hear why it's like, whoa, sort of uncanny in some right? ways. Yeah. So before we get to our interview with Wendy, we have some stuff to talk about, about uh, us. We do indeed. So, so like you mentioned, yes. we're now back to just audio on mm -hmm. our podcast. So I, I think that there are some places that carry just audio, they don't do video. So we're welcoming back our uh, audio visitors who've said, we want to listen to you. <laughs> yes, indeed. And uh, we've been interviewed on um, some podcasts as well. Mm -hmm. And I, I blog about that, by the way, folks. If you want to check out my blog, it's brucechalmer.com and um, slash blog if you want. Or if you go to my uh, couples therapy website, that's you go to brucechalmer.com, there's a thing to click to get to my couples therapy website, and you'll see that's where the blog is hanging out. Mm -hmm. I should put a link to that right on my homepage. Yeah, I? yeah, yeah, yeah. And will, then we have our yeah. our couples uh, our podcast, ctin7.com yep. website, where you can uh, find all of our podcast episode, And you can also find links to buy Bruce's latest book, it's not about communication, why everything you know about couples therapy is wrong. And I have to crow about the fact that for a brief shining moment, well, it was actually a couple of days, as a matter yes, of fact, it was. it was the number one bestseller mm -hmm. in one of its categories, couples and family therapy, which is mm -hmm. a perfectly appropriate category for it. And it was the number one bestseller on Amazon. And mm -hmm. I am just really psyched about that, as, as the kids don't say anymore. <laughs> As the kids said when I was a kid. <laughs> right? What do they say now? I have no I idea know. what I they say now. I juiced is no longer there. Right? I don't know. I don't know. They're We're they're just too old. If you're a kid listening to this, which is <laughs> based on our not. demographics, probably not. But if you are, or if you know what the kids say, tell us what the kids say. We want to know what the kids say. What do the kids say these days? What do the kids say? Yes. But in any case, yeah, the book uh, hit number one. And uh, of course, we want to keep that momentum going. It's available uh, on Kindle. Mm -hmm. Such a deal. As well, it's two ninety nine on Kindle. Mm -hmm. Uh, that'll probably go up when, uh, you know, as the sales yeah, increase, actually. Yeah, yeah. But for, for now, I've got it at two ninety nine. It's available as an audiobook, 
uh, where I did the narration. It's also available, of course, as a paperback from any place if you don't like to buy from Amazon. And this is where you can cue the Darth Vader theme, you know, dom, bum, 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 yep. whatever. Um, that's the one. That's the one. Uh, you can get it uh, from my website. Actually, there's a direct link. You can get it from Book Baby, which is the, the folks who actually do the printing. You can get it from anywhere you like. Uh, mm -hmm. you just ask them to order it and they'll order it for you. Right. And one of the other new things that they will find out about is signing up for your newsletter. Yes, indeed. You can sign up for my newsletter right from ctn7.com. A box will magically appear. It's just so exciting to see that bot box magically appear. That, that you should visit just to see that. Yes, I know, as I keep saying, I'm just overly impressed. It's amazing how you are impressed with technology, especially since you're an early programmer and, and I, probably saw stuff that nobody had seen back in the day. I go, hey, I go back to the punch card days, I folks. Know. That's the, my first programming <laughs> I did was in Fortran using punch cards. That's how old I am, folks. Um, so it's amazing that you're impressed by this appearing box. I am, which is like a simple thing in, I know. You know, when you're editing the website. But anyway, yeah, it's there. And, and you click lovely. on that. You click on that appearing box and that will just give you a little sign up form. All I ask for is your email and first name or a name, you know, just <laughs> something to call you. Uh, and you don't have to put any more in there. You can put your last name if you want to. Um, and I don't spam you. I send you a newsletter a couple, I, it's about twice a month, I think. You know, it's been every other week so far. And, uh, you know, the occasional extra something if there's some big exciting news to announce. But I don't spam you. And I certainly don't share, uh, you know, I'm super careful about that. I do not share your email with anybody else for any reason. Uh, so you're not going to be, <laughs> you know, I have no idea what the heck you know, Google and all of those various, you know, big brothers out there can figure out from what you do, but it's not because I'm doing it. Let's mm -hmm. put it that way. Right. So I do, yeah, urge you to yes, sign up. So the, sign the, up for the newsletter. Yeah, it's fun. There's, uh, I have tips, I have relationship tips, I have big ideas, I have news and schmooze. So please do that. Yes. So. And we, when you're there, we also have merch. merch. <laughs> we got merch on the CTN7 website. We got mugs. We got t-shirts. We got tote bags. With our beautiful logo, our beautiful motto, be kind, don't panic, and have faith. Yep. And they make wonderful gifts along with our books. They do. And uh, I think I even have a link on there where you can buy the books. So, yes. you know, you can go right there to ctn7.com. Mm -hmm. So, without further ado. Let's get on with the interview. So, you'll hear Judy introducing our guest. And then we will see you on the other side. Our guest today is Wendy Dumbroff. Wendy is a licensed professional counselor in private practice in Madison, New Jersey, where she specializes in individual, family, couples, and sex therapy. She is a certified teacher of mindfulness and meditation and brings these tools into her practice. As she explains, mindfulness helps people create a pause. It allows one to step back and say, what are my thoughts and what are my feelings? It creates a space for people to make different choices among many other benefits. Wendy, welcome to Couples Therapy in Seven Words. Oh, thank you so much and thank you for having me today. We're wow. delighted to have you. So we always like to start off with this question. Tell us, you know, how did you get into the work that you do? Tell us about your own journey into this work. Oh, okay. You know, it's interesting because counseling is a second career for me. Um, my first career, I, I was a pharmacist in my last life hmm. <laughs> in oh, the wow. undergrad world. But this was something, counseling was something that I... I think I even thought about early on in my 20s after I'd finished college and, you know, being busy and one day you'll get to that. And then I got married and ha had a family and <clears throat> finally took the exploration into my own therapy and was reminded uh, how interested I was in in that and, and life experiences along the way. And finally, I decided to take the plunge and go back to school. So in my early 40s, I did that. Um, and uh, one of my supervisor mentors in my internships had trained at the Ackerman Institute for the family. And she is, uh, her name's Meg Smith, and she's just a wonderful, wonderful therapist. And I thought, wow, if I could be half as good as Meg, <laughs> 
that was <laughs> great. And so I decided to do postgrad training at the Ackerman Institute and really loved the, the couple's work and recognized that with couples comes sex. And um, that's a huge issue. So I wanted to learn more about that. So I continued to do postgrad training in sex therapy. The mindfulness sort of came with a little dabbling in, in co-leading some DBT, dialectical behavior therapy groups. And uh, I had learned meditation back in the 90s, uh, transcendental meditation. So I was already interested in mindfulness and meditation. And so that sort of reopened the door there. And I pursued my studies there as well. And I, I really do take all of what I have learned, uh, the, the, my, my education from the Ackerman Institute and of course, experience and continued uh, consultation groups from with one of the senior faculty there who I'll probably talk about today. Wow. And, um, and I, I use it all, the, uh, the sex therapy, the couples therapy and the mindfulness, they all blend so well together. Mm -hmm. Wow, Wendy, it's listening to that, I'm sitting here thinking, I think we are spiritual siblings. <laughs> and I'll tell you what I mean by that. I also, uh -huh. this is, I, I'm, you know, I don't know if you know about the two of us. I'm a couples therapist. Judy is a, well, you can speak for yourself. An educator. An educator. And, uh -huh. um, but I, it's also a second career for me. Uh, it's also, I got into it, you know, through some of my own explorations. And I also uh, trained at the Ackerman Institute. <laughs> so, I, and that was wow. a good training. It was an externship. It was basically, I think, a three or four week externship back in the early 90s. But uh, oh. also in my 40s, that's when I got into it. It's really it's funny how we have yeah. parallels. Okay. <laughs> yeah, something that is interesting. Wow. So it's yeah. always nice to meet a fellow Ackerman alum. <laughs> yes, indeed. I really enjoyed that that uh, time. As I say, my, I think you you had more extensive training there than I did, but I really uh, benefited a lot from that externship that I did there. I also mm -hmm. I, I ended up doing also a uh, externship in at the Brattleboro Institute. Uh, which I think some of the folks there had connections to uh, Ackerman as well, as I recall. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very so um, why don't you tell us a little bit, you talked a little bit about uh, uh, using all of the talents and skills that you had. How do you uh, incorporate mindfulness practice in your couple sessions? Yeah, very, very great Great question. And, you know, for me, mindfulness has become such a uh, overarching thread in my own personal life and it really everything, uh, all the work that I do, whether it's couples or individual, because when mindfulness is just defining it, it's about awareness in the present moment, what is happening right now without judgment, with as Jack Cornfield, one of my teachers in the in the world of mindfulness, says he calls it loving awareness because it's whatever is being known, you also bring a loving presence to that. So if anger is being known rather than being harsh with oneself and angry with oneself for feeling anger, to bring a loving, compassionate presence to, oh, anger's here and it's hard to it's hard to feel this. This doesn't feel good. Mm -hmm. And and in couples work, one of the, when I work with couples, I look at what happens between people. Very, inter, I look at the interaction, the, what happens between them rather than a linear focus of if only you didn't do this, you know, I would, they wouldn't, I wouldn't do this, right? Mm -hmm. you, yeah. you make me do this. And so I look, well, well, when they do that, what do you do? What do you feel? And then what do you do? And then when you do that, what does the other person do? So I look at it very interactionally. Mm -hmm. And when people are in those patterns, it's very automatic. So needing to slow that down, uh, mindfulness is a great way to do that because if you can take a pause and breathe and notice that you're getting oh okay this is where i usually go into those patterns i usually start yelling and screaming or i usually shut down and i notice that i'm about to do that but since when you have awareness of what is happening you have the wisdom 
of choice. Mm, yeah. You choose from a very wise place. I know I'm about to do this. I know this may not be useful. It never has been useful before. Mm -hmm. So I have a choice here. It's interesting your your description of you know focusing on the interaction. I, I often will note that the couple itself is a living organism, just as the individuals are. Oh yes. And, and that's you know you're you're focusing on gee what is this what's this organism doing? How is it? Sometimes I'll I'll uh, I, I probably overuse the word panic. I sometimes mention that I'll say you know I use that in a very broad sense. Mm -hmm. When the when the organism itself gets into a panic that's indeed yeah. when the it does all sorts of things and it, there's a rationale for it in the moment but of course it turns out to be you know often destructive for other things mm -hmm. i love that i lo i love thinking of that as a uh I, if, I'll, I'll, if i can borrow that metaphor from <laughs> going forward but the couple as an organism that goes into panic yeah yeah oh yeah feel free and of course i'm sure i didn't make it up i don't know where it came from but <laughs> well i'll quote you anyway <laughs> yeah you know and sometimes i'll note with folks during the pandemic i've noted you know you sort of have to give uh, at least i feel i have to give grudging credit to the covid virus for being so damn clever mm. because and it's in the the patterns that will take over in a couple are often very similar they're sort of like the covid virus it's like it figured that the pattern figures out just what buttons to press in each person to to uh, further freak out the other one yes so it, it perpetuates itself it's like the covid virus figured out oh what a clever idea if i can if i can be contagious before i'm symptomatic they won't be able to stop me it's brilliant you, know, you got to give the damn thing credit you know even right, there's a, yes there's a poem in there i think undoubtedly <laughs> yes <laughs> Yeah, I I hear you. I hear exactly what you mean. Yes. And when couples can take that breath, when the organism can take that breath, and as well as looking at the other, look within, turn in and look and say, what's happening here? Mm -hmm. Tara Brock, one of my other teachers in the world of mindfulness, she talks about taking the U-turn in. Mm. And in that pause there there's a wonderful book by her called radical compassion which goes through this rain meditation r-a-i-n and it is really a process of being what what do i do in this u-turn how can i get in touch with what's going on with me right now inside and it the r is to recognize what am i experiencing the a is to allow it the i is to investigate it with kindness. And the N is what does this feeling need to nurture it? And mm. the I is a lot of the work that we do in, in therapy. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. was, I was wondering, do you, in fact, like when you're sitting with couples, do you take them through like a guided meditation sometimes? Or how do you, how do you do that? I have done that. Uh, yes, I absolutely have done that. However, I find that in the limited time that we have for the couples therapy itself, there's there's not always enough time for that. Mm -hmm. um, I have done it. Uh, sometimes, especially if a, if conflict emerges and um, people are very amped up in the session, mm -hmm. it's very triggered. It's it's obviously hard for anyone to take anything in yeah. in in that space. So being able to take a breath together and just step away from it for a moment and get in touch with what's happening in our bodies, um, it can be useful. Yeah, that's John Gottman's thing about, I think he and Julie will have, they'll put pulse oximeters on people's fingers and if it exceeds a certain rate, they go in separate rooms, you know? <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> wow. yeah, I, know, I, yeah, I know the Gottmans do that. Um, yeah. And yeah, uh, but I've never put a pulse oximeter on it. No, me neither. <laughs> it, it's no not medical. real practical. <laughs> yeah. Nor is it practical to take a 20-minute break in the middle of a session, which is what they do also. Uh, you know, it, it depends on, on the parameters you're working with. Yeah, yeah. So, but, but what I will do, it, 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 they may not recognize that I'm using mindfulness. It, it may not be in a formal meditation but I will encourage questions that help them to turn in. Mm. You know, what's happening right now? I saw your face get an angry look and you turned away from your partner. Can we just be with this moment and turn in? Mm -hmm. 
or if someone has tears, tears come up, right? Really just pause the session and honor what's happening because obviously something is in there that is begging for unpacking mm -hmm. and and in that way, just helping. And when I guess when I say that mindfulness flows throughout, that, that, that is the lens that I'm coming from. Like, let's understand exactly what's going on for this person right now. Mm -hmm. What are they feeling in their body? What are what 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 is happening for them? Because and sometimes they don't even know. Sure. Yeah. How yeah. do you incorporate uh, the mindfulness work into couples that have sexual issues? Ah, that is a. Uh, uh, that is a place where mindfulness is exceedingly useful. Um, and one of my mentors in the sex therapy field, Suzanne Ayasenza, has really put together a beautiful way that she gives people, we, and I do this as well, to give people an exercise, right? Maybe it's just massaging each other's hands. Maybe it is touching each other's bodies. But being able to get in touch again with the thoughts the feelings, and the, what it's like in the body. And a la Suzanne, um, have them write that down in the moment and bring it to the session. Because when we can see everything else that we're adding on to what may be there, if you recognize, oh my goodness, I'm thinking about what am I going to make for dinner tomorrow? Or the kids need to get picked up or, oh, I'm so uncomfortable with my body. I wish I wasn't being touched in this spot or, oh my God, is my penis going to work this time around? Mm -hmm. um, when, when we see all those things that get added on, right? We begin to recognize, well, how can you be having a, a enjoyable sexual experience when there's all this stress that's it there as well yeah and just like with meditation just sitting in in formal meditation perhaps using breathing as an anchor um when you notice all those thoughts and feelings you can come back to the body mm -hmm. just keep coming back to the body it's so interesting the, i'd imagine yeah. just the act of stepping back you know having the having the intention that you're not just going to experience, you're going to step back and notice the experience, which is what mindfulness is all about, you know, from a, from one step removed from the panic, you know, mm -hmm. you say, yeah. Oh, look at that. Look at all those interesting feelings happening. You know, yes. I seem to yes. be panicking, thinking, you know, X, Y, or Z. And yeah. uh, just that act of doing it has the effect of sort of calming it, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably turns on as, as Dan Siegel would say, turns on that uh, brings the prefrontal cortex back online when we yeah. get, begin to step back and name what's happening. Yeah, yeah. I, I had an experience years ago. I would I often use when I'm talking about mindfulness with folks, which is years ago. I, I, one of my earlier parts of my career, I was running around teaching courses in data communications, and I remember one time many years ago, we were taken the class that I was teaching. We were taken on a little field trip to a. Um, an operations center for one of the big, I think it was 9X at the time, you know, one of the big uh, telephone networks. And we got to be up in this observation deck and, mm -hmm. looked, and looked down upon all those folks down there who were at their consoles and, you know, in these big maps of where there were issues happening. And, you know, had there been some emergency going on, we would have observed all these people running around seeming very, you know, very upset and very, you know, focused and, and intense. Yeah. And we would have been up in this observation just saying, oh, isn't that interesting? Look how intense it is. Yeah. And that's often, I, I often use that as sort of a metaphor for mindfulness that you can, that, that uh. part of your brain that can just step to the observation deck and look and say, oh, look at, look at all that stuff going on. Wow. There's, yeah. there must be a lot of anxiety down there. You know? wow, that's very interesting. So I, I like that the observation deck, right? Yeah. <laughs> the, and, you know, when I, explain mindfulness and and sometimes I think imagine I say to people imagine that you're and these aren't my metaphors these are things I've learned but uh you're you're on the top of a mountain and you're watching the clouds going by mm -hmm. and it's like the mind watching the mind but I love the idea of the observation deck of the mind yeah um, I yeah. think that 
I think it was a Dan Siegel one, actually, as I re if I'm remembering right. I, I, I remember stealing this one for some uh, meditation <laughs> work that I use with folks about uh, it's like you're at the bottom of an ocean, apparently able to breathe. That's no problem. Yeah. And you're just looking up at the surface. And sometimes the surface is calm and sometimes it's all choppy and sometimes it's just really, you know, in a big storm. But mm -hmm. where you are at the bottom, it's just calm. It's just there's no, yeah. you know, nothing going on. You can just see all the stuff going on up there. Yes. Yes. Well, yeah. One of the other practices that you had mentioned was the vulnerability cycle. I'm not sure if practice yeah. is the right word, but you want to talk a little bit about the vulnerability cycle? Sure. The vulnerability cycle is a model that was developed by Michelle Shankman and Mona Fishbane. And Michelle is uh, one of the senior faculty from the Ackerman Institute and Scott lots of papers about the vulnerability cycle um, and its usefulness. And, and I am fortunate to be able to be in a consultation group with, with Michelle that she leads. Mm -hmm. And the vulnerability cycle forms the basis, I would say, of all the couples work that I do. It's a model where you actually understand the interaction between people. So the vulnerabilities are the things that trigger people. Maybe they feel lonely. Maybe they're worried their partner will leave. They feel aban you know, abandonment. They feel uh, somebody gets loud and they feel anxiety, right? And then when a person gets triggered and feels whatever it is they're feeling, there's a behavior that follows. Maybe they yell and scream. When they yell and scream, their partner feels their own anxiety, their own, I'm not good enough, I've not performed properly, I'm not okay here. And then they do something, maybe they, maybe they shut down, right? And then the more the one partner shuts down, the more the other, the second partner feels, oh my God, they're, they're not here for me. The perhaps abandonment issues arise. And so they pursue to have that need met, but the more they pursue, the more the other person feels I've failed, I'm not good enough, and the more they shut down. And so that is that is what interactionalizes the uh, the organism of the couple. Mm -hmm. and and it's the it's the dance that they do. And when i I literally draw it out for couples, and when they see that, you really just like see it on paper. Oh, so this this is the self-sustaining pattern that happens but that's where they can see it you can and know that they can change that dance and of course it it ultimately there's an exploration of families of origin because most of the time i won't say all the time sometimes there's significant adult later life events that can create triggers but very often as i'm sure you know it, what triggers us is embedded in our childhood, in the families that we grow up in, mm -hmm. as well as the survival strategies that we use, the way we cope. And um, and sometimes it makes sense. I always say to people, the things you feel, the things you do make sense. It just may not be useful mm -hmm. in your adult relationships. It made sense growing up. Ah. It's how you survived in the home that you grew up in. Yeah. And it's not necessarily needed now. Good way to think about it. Yeah, that it is one of my favorite themes that I almost always say pretty much in the first session to every couple is that I point out, you know, now that we're old buddies and I've known you for 10 minutes, I can already <laughs> tell, well, at least not, neither of you is nuts, to use a technical <laughs> term. Which is, and, and sometimes people say, oh, you haven't seen when we get going, you know, but, and I don't mean to be flippant, as I always say to people, I mean to be flippant about mental health issues, but rarely am I working with a couple where one or the other is dealing with psychosis. It's usually, which is to say, all of those reactions that you're talking about have a basis. They may not have a, you know, they may not be super functional now, but exactly as you said, they they have a basis. You're not crazy. You came, you know, the usual mixture of, of genetics and experience, you know, we came yes. by the way we are in a valid way. We're all valid to be who we are. And you work with that. And, you know, when I, I, I often use the word faith to describe just that sense that says we're valid to be who we are. That's we are valid individuals. Mm -hmm. And then you work with it. And yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. 
I, I yes, I, I totally agree. I might probably use the language more of saying it, it makes sense. Like, yeah, look mm -hmm. at this. Look what it was like for you growing up. You were never heard. So you got louder to be heard. Mm -hmm. and that makes sense. That was the only way you could feel that that your voice was there. Yeah. Uh, and so now that's what you're doing. But it doesn't work in this relationship. Mm -hmm. It's not useful. Yeah. Uh, and it makes sense. So I think I like now, now might no. be a good time to go to our listener letter. Is that okay? Oh, of course. Okay. So this comes from Terry and she writes, Dear Bruce and Judy, I am a 47-year-old woman married to a 53-year-old man I'll call Tom. I'm writing because I've heard the two of you interview some sex therapists on your podcast, and I'm not sure that's what I need or not. We generally get along okay, but our sex life has been getting to be a problem. We used to have sex about once a week. That was fine. No huge fireworks, but I enjoyed it and I think Tom did too. But a couple of years ago, maybe it had something to do with the pandemic, Tom started having trouble keeping his erection. He talked to his doctor and got Viagra, which seemed to help at first, but it kept happening. His doctor checked him out and didn't find anything medically wrong with him. He's not on any medications, doesn't smoke, and keeps fit. His testosterone le level is normal. I'm starting to worry that he doesn't find me attractive anymore. I also try to keep fit, but at 47, I don't look like a supermodel, not that I ever did. I've asked him, and he says he thinks I'm as attractive as ever and that it's not me. But I know he's able to masturbate. He admitted it when I asked him. So I can't figure out why it doesn't work when we're together. Is this something I should talk to a sex therapist about? Or can any couples therapist handle this? Or should I suggest that Tom go to an individual counselor? What do you think I should do? So Wendy, mm. we turn it over to you. Wow, that is such a beautiful description. She really didn't leave anything out. She really is very thoughtful about the uh, the whole scenario. Mm -hmm. First, I want to say that I don't think I've ever met a woman whose husband has uh, had erectile issues or lack of, even lack of interest, um, who hasn't first gone to blame herself isn't it that something yeah i noticed that too it's I've, I've often commented i think there's something biological about it you know evolutionary terms it's like you're supposed to blame yourself even though it's not it isn't true but you're supposed yeah. to blame yourself or something i don't know i'm talking to women yeah <laughs> you can tell me what you think women. yeah yeah because well the 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 whole societal sexual message is that men are sex monsters and they will want you know, they'll jump on anything, right? Mm -hmm. Which of course isn't right. true. Yeah. And women, it's like, well, but he doesn't want me anymore. It must be me, mm -hmm. right? Oh, he, he can he masturbate. It's interesting that she knows that he can masturbate. That's usually a question that I will ask um, privately mm -hmm. uh, with men. Um, and, and I will say that men without fail, always, almost always tell me, no, it's not it's not my wife. Yes, it's not that. I hear that too. Exactly. Something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there are different ways to approach this. I would uh, encourage them to see someone who is trained in sex therapy. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like mm -hmm. the couple's relationship is in a good place overall. Mm -hmm. A lot of times people come for sexual issues, but the marriage itself has so much going on and conflict and, and patterns that aren't useful that you have to do kind of some groundwork before you can even get to the sexual issues. Mm -hmm. um, although they're also embedded and, and throughout and, and have meaning as well in the other issues. Um, but I, I would encourage her to see someone who is trained in sexual issues. And, you know, as I was listening to her story and especially the age of her husband, um, it's good that he absolutely gets checked out medically and make sure that not only um, with his uh, system, you know, his 
urological system that everything is okay there, but also cardiovascularly that everything is okay because uh, uh, what can happen is if men have, suddenly they have erectile issues and um, that, that weren't there before, it could show, because just as the, the bigger vessels that go to the heart can get blocked, so can the smaller vessels that that uh, supply blood to the to yeah. the penis. So and I, as I understand, they'll often show it first, right? That's the thing. The, the small vessels that supply blood to the penis are apt to, you know, not not have enough there as an early sign that maybe you're not getting enough blood altogether because there's some blockage, you know, in, in some artery somewhere. Right. Yes, absolutely. And uh so that's very important to rule out any any medical issues. But it sounds like this is a fit gentleman and the fact that he can have an erection when he masturbates also speaks to the fact that it's not it's not likely to be something uh, like blocked vessels because there's no amount of um, masturbation that will change that, right? Mm -hmm. there, that's, that's not the erection is not going to present if that there's a physical barrier to it. Yeah. Um, a colleague of mine and a, another mentor in the field has just written a book. His name is Dr. Dan Water, W-A-T-T-E-R. Mm -hmm. He has written a book called The Existential Life of the Penis. It's a, huh. a man's guide to sexuality. And he I would ask the, the question. Wow. Now, right? yeah. <laughs> and, and there's actually a chapter in the book that is The Penis Speaks. Wow. And so we have to ask, what is the penis saying? I'm sorry, here, I'm getting the, right? a, a visual here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what is the penis saying? In some way, it is saying, oh, my goodness, there is something, uh, all of this unconscious, of course, but a full exploration of family of origin, history, what is this man's penis saying? And also, I know, you know, Dan comes from a very existential view he he had supervised with victor yalom oh, yeah. uh, Yal, yeah, Irvin Ir Yalom. sorry yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah i'm getting victor frankel confused victor frankel, with yes, exactly. yalom uh, way back <laughs> when and he has a very existential view and it it's fascinating to hear him talk about these cases but he i know i think dan would also be talking about a death anxiety that might be present as men get into certain ages mm -hmm. and and understanding more, you know, without understanding, knowing this gentleman's family of origin and his history, um, uh, I, I think it would be hard to comment, but what is his penis saying? I, I'm curious as to why his penis works elsewhere, but not here with his wife. Mm. And um, he, probably is still attracted to and and most 47 year old women having probably had a couple of kids uh, our bodies are not um necessarily what they were when we were 27 right mm -hmm. sure. uh, yeah. and it's so interesting you know all those men who say it really isn't her and of course man myself and i'm thinking yeah i know what you mean i know what you mean by that it isn't her you know and and it yeah. i think it's often hard for women to understand that that no it is it isn't anything personal about her it, there may be other things indeed that aren't necessarily medical per se but there may be other things distracting him and of course one of the biggies that i see in this and I, actually i'm curious to see if this fits into your um, the model of the vulnerability cycle that just the fact that as so often she's starting to worry, oh, no, is it me? Do you not find me attractive? And he starts to worry then, oh, no, I'm letting her down. I'm giving, you know, I'm making my wife feel bad. My wife whom I love, I'm making her feel bad. And yeah. I don't want to make her feel bad. And so his anxiety goes up, which is the least sexy thing <laughs> possible. <laughs> and so no wonder right. his penis wilts because he's just, he's too busy worrying about, oh, no, am I hurting my wife? And you know, yes. it's a it's a nasty cycle. I don't know. Does that sort of fit into the the notion of a vulnerability? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. That interactionalizes what's what's going on between them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and then another thought on this is to help this couple in this couple's age. I mean, look, all those Masters and Johnson studies were done uh, back uh, uh, on 18, 20 year olds, right? We we are not eighteen, twenty. Our whole lives 
And so sometimes it requires, and this is, you know, again, I go back to Suzanne Iacenza expanding the sexual menu. And, mm -hmm. you know, there are so many other things that couples can do to be close, to be connected, to be sexual with each other. And sex, the definition of sex expands. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to mean penetration. It doesn't even have to mean orgasm. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it, to create a soft penis menu, sexual menu, where, mm -hmm. where a hard penis is not even required for that. It's interesting. So, there's, there's a hint in the letter, I think. And I'm, I'm looking at a copy of it here. There's a hint in the letter that you know, we used to have sex about once a week. That was fine. No huge fireworks, but I enjoyed it. And I think Tom did too. There's an implication there. It's not like everybody has to have fireworks all the time, but there's an implication there that it was perhaps getting kind of routine and they weren't really exploring mm -hmm. other, you know, expanding their repertoire at all. And another thing yeah. that she also mentioned, she didn't know if it had something to do with the pandemic that, you know, we don't know how that affected his mental well-being either. Um, if yes. that, if there was a change in job, a change in job status, a change in responsibility, and how that's affecting, you know, the, a lot that put a lot of stress on people in so many ways, that could also be playing into it. Yes, I agree, and also the fact that a lot of people ended up working from home, so they don't have. We didn't the usual, all those usual extra social engagements that we had in our lives, we didn't have. Right. Even just being at work and and perhaps that made this gentleman feel more vital and inter interacting with people versus, you know, sitting in a in a home office um, or or a, a makeshift office from for in an extra bedroom or something. Right. And doing their work that way. So yes, the, the we're smiling because we're, we're, we're sitting in a home office, in, a home office in an extra bedroom. <laughs> yeah. we happen to be away. We're, we live in Vermont. We happen to be in Florida at the moment when we're recording this, but we're in a oh. place here, but yeah, we have an extra bedroom because that's, I work from, you know, I work by telehealth. Uh -huh. And so here we are uh -huh. in our home office in our extra bedroom. So <laughs> I can relate. And, and because yes. of the pandemic, as a matter of fact, yes. <laughs> that's when I started, wow. you know, that's when I shut down my, uh, my personal office space. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah. Yes. I still have my office space, uh, but I don't use it nearly as much. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> There's been changes for everybody. But yes, I agree. The, the layer of the pandemic is a whole other area of exploration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Most definitely. Well, I hope Terry that uh, that helps you. And I mean, we change names of, of folks. So, but but in any case, I and we actually don't know this person beyond having got a, a letter from her. Um, mm -hmm. But I hope that is helpful uh, for her. Uh, where should we send people if they want to learn more about you or your work or get in touch with you or what should we do? Oh, uh, I have a website. It's wendydumbroftherapy.com. It's Wendy with an I at the end. Most people spell it with a Y. So mm -hmm. that, that makes a difference. But uh, all my information is is on there, um, wendydumbroftherapy.com. And are there any other topics that you'd like to talk about that we haven't touched on? You know, I just have, I have one last thought for Terry. Um, uh, the reason that I say someone who's trained in sex therapy is it, not all couples therapists are even comfortable talking about sex, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. um, but many mm -hmm. are. So I think the reason that I guide her more to somebody who is trained in sex therapy or really any couples therapist that has um, comfort in that area, Yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll tell you a little anecdote. I, I think I've mentioned this before on our podcast. Mm -hmm. I was at a training within the past year, a few months ago, uh, for, you know, it's a continuing education training, as we all need. And this was for specifically about couples therapy. So it was on Zoom. There were like 100 therapists there, the vast majority of which I'm pretty sure I did practice couples therapy. And the trainer asked people, uh, he did a little poll, you know, on Zoom and said, okay, mm -hmm. how many of you ask couples, if they haven't mentioned it already, how many of you ask couples about their sex life in the first or second session? And I'm sitting there thinking, well, we all do that, don't we? <laughs> and, and, then, and the poll came back and it was about 30%. I think it was about wow. 30, 40, some, you know, mm -hmm. below 50%. Like, yeah. and I was yes. flabbergasted, frankly, because like, holy cow, all these 
therapist. And then some people would describe this. I don't know. I wait for them to bring it up as if it's like, it's this, uh, sort of, you know, forbidden topic, or yeah. you have to handle it really carefully. And of course you convey that mm -hmm. to your clients and then they're afraid to bring it up too. Wow. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's crazy. Sex and money, right? <laughs> Sex and money, the two biggest, uh, the two biggest taboo subjects yeah well and 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 religion actually I spirituality religion and, 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 religion and religion and politics yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know, all of the i asked Especially about all of them. <laughs> yeah yes yes wow very well thank you so much for doing this thank you so so very much for having me it's been it really has been a pleasure to to speak with both of you Great. It's been very enlightening. I, I always learn so much from our guests. That's why I like doing this podcast, I think, more than anything else. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, me too. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I learned tremendous amount. Well, thank you, Wendy. I, I always well. learn. I always learn when I when I do them as well. So I, I thank you as well. You're very welcome. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Wendy Dumbroff. I, as I said to Wendy, I'm always learning a lot from our guests and she certainly had a lot of good things to say. She did indeed. And as I, I mentioned, just very knowledgeable and very, mm -hmm. and a lot of the names of the folks that she mentioned that she studies with or is mentored by, those are well-known folks and, and very respected folks in the field. So mm -hmm. she is uh, is keyed into that and it's uh, I, I learned a lot from her as well. Yeah. So uh, we would like to invite you to uh, rate us and subscribe to us and do all those sorts of things that let other people know about this podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, you can do that right from, um, you can subscribe using whatever uh, platform you get this on. Uh, and also if you can share and like our, and follow our social media posts, we're basically on Facebook, that's right. where we Pretty are. Pretty much that's it. Uh, at Couples Therapy in Seven Words, you'll <laughs> right. find it there. Um, you can also go to at Dr. Bruce Chalmer and you'll see some stuff there. And we often cross post uh, mm -hmm. between those two. Right. And if you go to our website, ctn7.com, uh, you can see a place where if you, like Terry, have a question you'd like us to put on the air, um, write to us. And there's a spot there where you can write to us. There's also a place where you can suggest guests. And if you would like to be a guest on our program, you can put yourself down as a guest. And you can even sign up for a time. I've got a, what is it called? Calendly Cal link? Yeah. Calendly, how would they pronounce that? Yeah. Folks, uh, the, the mavens out there who do uh, scheduling will know what I'm talking about. It's, a, it's basically a link to our calendar mm -hmm. that lets you sign up for a time. You'll see what's available. Yep. We usually record on Fridays. Mm -hmm. uh, we can sometimes accommodate other times too. So if you, you know, drop us a line. And just drop us a line and give us some feedback. What do you think about this? Yeah, we'd love to hear from you. We yeah. love hearing from our listeners. We do indeed. And let's put in another word for the books I've written. We didn't mention the, the book I wrote a couple years ago, which That's is... That's right, in the, in the intro we in did the intro. not. So we will say that in the outro. Reigniting the Spark, Why Stable Relationships Lose Intimacy and How to Get It Back. And that's been out for uh, coming up on three years, amazingly. Yeah, three yeah, years. Yeah, it started, it was released right at the, yeah, the, released the pandemic. <laughs> right at the pandemic. And in <laughs> fact, it was, I think it was like February 29th of 2020. It was I on think Leap it Day. was. Yeah. And that's, that's how we ended up doing the podcast because we couldn't make any public appearances. That's right. And so here we are. The rest is, the rest is history. Here We're still doing we it. This is episode, I think it's what, 103 or 104? It's over 100. It's yeah. Over yeah. 100. yeah. Um, and so you can get that book. And then my much more recent book, which just came out a few weeks ago. Right. It's not about communication. Why everything you know about couples therapy is wrong. And if you find that a provocative title, and if you think, well, that's ridiculous or that's arrogant or whatever, I urge you, read the book. And you may still think that after you've read the book, in which case, write me a letter and tell me that. And you know what? If you write me an articulate enough letter complaining about my book, I will be inclined to invite you on the podcast because <laughs> I love that. Uh, I don't know. Maybe you shouldn't say that. Maybe you'll scare them away. <laughs> no, not at all. Well, you, you don't have to accept, folks. <laughs> Just because I invite you doesn't mean you have to come on. That's no, I really, I'm really trying to engage folks sure. by having a title that is as, frankly, silly as that. Why everything you know about couples therapy is mm -hmm. wrong is rather overstated, shall we say. But I, the book does bust some myths. Yes, it does. Uh, that's what it's about. And uh, and you may disagree with me, and I want to hear that. And look, I always like to throw in, spoiler alert, folks, in the last chapter of my book, I do point out 
it's not just you. Everything I know about couples therapy is wrong too. <laughs> and you know, what do I mean by that? I don't literally mean everything I'm saying no, is nonsense. Don't give away the book. I don't want to give away the book. <laughs> I, but I can say what I mean by that, which is simply that the and the book has a couple of chapters on this. Yes. It's the knowing part. It's mm -hmm. the think you know too much part. Mm -hmm. That's the part that's dangerous. It's when the ideas, which you know, ideas are open you up and expose you to things you hadn't thought of, when they turn into ideologies, that's what does damage. And that's true in the therapy world and it's true in relationships. And that's what I write about in the book. So mm -hmm. I hope you'll read that. And of course, we want to hear from you about the book as well. Uh, really looking for folks to do, am I, you hear me hesitating before I say Amazon, the A word, you know, but oh, that's how people well, find out about books these days. That's where most people are. Do an Amazon say. review, you know, of course, we'd like it to be a five star review, but do an Amazon review, you know, rate it and review it. Um, we really, that of course helps let people know about it. It helps Amazon's algorithms tell other folks about mm -hmm. it. Definitely. I think we've covered what we need I to cover. I think we have. Well, good. And so until next time. Remember, be kind. Don't panic. And have faith. Mm -hmm.